Welcome to Indiana Sports Beat Radio, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Know your role and shut your mouth, you jabroni. Fires upfield into the end zone, and it's caught. Jelani Woods, touchdown, I-N-D-Y. A 43-point night for Tyrese Halliburton. I do you like that, partner? Galloway drives. All the way to the hole, throws it off, got it! Indiana's got their first lead of this contest. I mean, that's a goddamn Emmy winner right there. Now, from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, here's your host, Jim Coyle. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing? I hope you're having a great day. A Tuesday here, coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, Indiana Sports Speed Radio. Jim Coyle with you as always. Looking forward to uh, talking to another. Great lineup, great guest. Mike DeCourcy will be joining us, Crowning Cooser, and Mike Nizelik from the uh, Bloomington Herald Times. Last night, uh, good gosh, what a great uh, Monday night football game between Seattle and the Eagles. If you stayed up to watch that, like I did, Seattle with an incredible last minute TD drive. Um, just a fun game to watch. Looking forward to uh, talking to Mike. Haven't talked to Mike in a, in a week. What's new uh, with everybody else? What's going on? Is everybody ready for Christmas? How are you getting ready for uh, Christmas? Have you got your shopping done? Did you do it all online? I think I, yes, I, I did all of mine online. It's kind of a shame. I feel like it makes it a lot easier though nowadays. Oh, you, of course like, it does. <laughs> I mean, you, you can legitimate. I mean, I feel like even when I was in high school and a little before high school, like you used to have to go to the mall to get your shopping done. And I mean, yeah, you could you could order some things online, but the delivery wasn't nearly as fast back then. And you sometimes things would show up late more often than not. Actually, it seemed like. And nowadays, you can. And maybe it takes away from the spirit of it a little bit, maybe, depending on who you ask. But, I mean, I like being able to do it from the comfort of, you know, the bedroom, the the, the living room, whatever it might be. It's easy. Yep. Uh, it's uh, it, it has made it easy as pie, but uh, I, I hate that for um, – I, I do hate that for the mom and pop stores out there. But all the stuff that I bought, I, I don't think that uh, – there's not much of it that I would have purchased pop store. from a mom and pop store. Maybe not all of them, but there's a lot that you can even see advertising on Facebook for online things nowadays. So they're adapting just like we have. And, you know, maybe it isn't as bad as you might think. Yep, uh, absolutely. Indiana uh, takes uh, gets to the hardwood tonight. They take on, I forgot. John Boyd. The last three games, I know they have North Alabama, they have Kennesaw State, but I think those are the next two. Who do they play tonight? Um, you know what? I'm drawing a blank because I'm thinking about the women's team who last night destroyed Evansville. They blistered the Nets, shooting 71% for the game from the field. Uh, I, I, incredible. They barely missed a shot. Uh, the entire night, they set a record. I mean, this is a, uh, they set a bunch of records, as a matter of fact. As soon as I get that pulled up to. Uh, Indiana takes on Moorhead State, by the way. Moorhead State, yeah. Thanks to the commenters for being more educated than I. Or well, more informed, I, I should say, than I. Yeah, quick thinking. I couldn't uh, come up with that. But I'm looking for the, uh, I sent this to myself so I would have it. Now, I don't know where it is course all this new stuff come in in front of it but uh 71 percent for the game it's it's like that's that sets all kinds of records uh for indiana it's it was the highest that's the highest in ncaa division one this season um 71.7 percent from the floor as a matter of fact, 109 56 win over Evansville, which I don't care who you're playing, shooting this well is crazy. Um, 
uh, Garzon um, and uh, Sydney Parrish, they combined to go seven for seven in the first 10 minutes. Indiana tacked on 24 points in the second quarter. They had 34 points in the third quarter, which is the most since the game format went to quarters in 2015-2016. They shot 79.3% in the second half and outscored Evansville 58-38. to 28. How about that? I mean, crazy. 71% for the game, which again is the uh, – the highest single game field goal percentage in NCAA Division I women's college basketball this season. Uh, the previous high was Michigan State at 70%. It marked the program's highest single game field goal percentage ever with a previous record of 68% against Iowa in 1975. Yarzan, uh, Garzan. Yardin Garzon had a near-perfect shooting night. She uh, went 12 of 14 from the field, 3 of 4 at the line. Career-high 30 points. Mackenzie Holmes with a double-double, 22 points, 10 rebounds. 31 points from the bench. But uh, that's IU's win streak is now eight games. 16 straight wins at home in non-conference play and 109 points were the most scored by the program in a game this season. So a lot of good things for them. Now, and then we've come tomorrow coming up is national signing day in college football. So we're, man, We'll have a lot to talk about then, but more to talk about on Thursday once it's actually happened because it doesn't happen until after we've uh, done the show. But National Signing Day is tomorrow, and Indiana football has a lot to talk about uh, when it comes to that. They've got a lot of guys coming in, and there's a lot of excitement. I, I, I've never seen this much excitement um, in the football program. I've got to be honest with you. It's it's crazy. Um, you you can you can tell it's whenever uh, information goes out or I put something out and, and the response that it gets. Uh, that's a response that normally I haven't seen before in in football here, and which is great. It's a great thing. And they'll have all that expectation going into the season and an exciting season in which the, the Big Ten gets larger. Indiana will play two teams that are currently playing in the college football playoffs, Michigan and Washington. So all kinds of things uh, to look forward to there. Tom Allen over to Penn State. Um I sent him an, uh, a text congratulating him, and he texted back. And the last thing on it, <laughs> I find this hilarious. He would always sign off with LAO, always has in anything. Now it's we are. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I swear. I think James Franklin told him to drop the LAO. No, I'm just saying it's that's the Penn State deal. We are Penn State is what they say. Well, I know that's their thing, but it's interesting that he's – I kind of thought that was part of his brand, the LEO. Maybe, maybe he'll still use it in some capacity, but that's interesting. It, well, his is not what theirs is, so that's what matters. Yeah. Well, LEO was never an Indiana thing until he came along. That was more so his thing than an Indiana thing. We are – isn't a James Franklin thing. It's a Penn State thing. Right. Well, that's so I just thought LEO could follow him wherever he went, not nah. just in Indiana. But nah. I, I get what you're saying, though. He may uh, use that within his people or say it a lot, but I, I yeah, I don't think so. But uh, I, I just found it funny how quickly you make the adaption, man. 
you make the adaption. So it's funny. I found that uh, hilarious. Uh, the new AP poll did come out, of course, and Indiana is still not in it. But Purdue goes to the top spot. Uh, we had talked about that yesterday, whether or not they might jump because of uh, the win over Arizona. I mean, how do you not, even though Kansas was ahead of them, you beat the number one team. Kind of hard not to put them up there. Uh, and so they haven't, you know, they they haven't been ranked number one hardly ever. Um, this is only like the second or third time, I think. Kansas stays at number two. Houston moves up the spot to number three. Arizona drops down to number four. UConn just hanging in at number five. There, I, I can't understand. They've lost one time. Why UConn is not getting... I, I don't think Kansas is the number, number two team in the country. I, I just don't. And I know you can't drop them after a losing at Indiana without question, but I just don't think that they're the number two team in the country. And I, UConn is tougher than nails. Marquette is number six. Marquette is the team that beat. Is that the team that beat Kansas, I think? Yeah, but you mentioned UConn. Kansas beat UConn in the head-to-head, so that be, that makes sense that they're ahead of UConn. Yeah, um, it's it's just fun. Oklahoma number seven, Tennessee there number eight. Both of those jumping up four spots. Kentucky jumps up five spots to jump into the top ten at number nine. Baylor dropping down to number ten. How, how is that a, a top 10 team when they were absolutely brutalized by Michigan State? They were, it was 45 to 15. How, how, how can you be, there's no way that's a top 10 team. Uh, North Carolina is number 11, although they dropped a few spots. Creighton dropped four spots to number 12. Illinois. From the Big Ten moves up to number 13. Florida Atlantic moves up a spot to 14. Gonzaga, big drop as they took a loss. Colorado State. See, this has to make Indiana fans sick to their stomach. Teams like Colorado State are ranked 16th. BYU is 17th. Clemson. 18th, Texas. James Madison stays the same at number 20. Duke is 21. Break. 22. Uh, let's see. Wisconsin, 24 from the Big Ten as well. We've got to take a break. Looking forward to talking to Mike DeCourcy up next. Ask him about that uh, win by the Colts over the Steelers. That was big. We'll be back with more here on Indiana Sports Beat Radio right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. In the mar- morning, Mike. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well on a Tuesday. Woke up thinking it was Friday, which is very weird for a Tuesday. But nonetheless, we move all, we move forward. Mike, are you making your weekly trips to Chicago for BTN right now? 
No, I start uh, first full weekend. I think it's the sixth in January. Okay. So ba- mainly once we're in the thick of conference play, is right. when we start doing that. Okay. Yeah, we start uh, Big Ten basketball and beyond on the seventh, and I'll be in on the sixth as well for our games on BTN that day with John Beeline, the legend. Oh wow! Yeah. Will this be his first time doing TV? No, he's been doing it for a while. Uh, okay. This is it, he, he uh, actually uh, our first appearance together was the night of the IU Nebraska game that you may recall. Uh, we like not to talk about that, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was uh, that was our first time together, and and, uh, and then we did the um, in twenty one when we were back to having a tournament. We did it remotely, but we did the selection show together. Okay. But this is my first time in the studio with him since then. Uh, quite an honor to be on, to be honest with you. Although I've been honored to be with most of the people that I've been paired with. All the people, really. I mean, I, like you could do, you could do like an all-time Big Ten greats. He'll be the coach now, and the team would be Jimmy Jackson and Steve Smith and Scooney Penn and Mateen Cleaves, uh, <laughs> Ray Bell, uh, Steve Bardo. What a team that would be. We just don't have – well, I guess we have Sean Morris for a big guy. That's our big guy. And uh, Jess settles to bring energy. Jess, Jess was the hardest playing dude, man. <laughs> I, 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 I tease him all the time. I, I used to go to the Nike camp when I was here. Uh, in the early days at the uh, at uh, IUPUI. And, right, here uh, we go, guys. Just a couple okay. seconds left. This segment is brought to you by The Chop Shop, home of the Indiana football and men's basketball coaches shows. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Speed Radio here on this Tuesday, coming to you from the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios, of course. And now we welcome in the great Mike DeCourcy from the Sporting News and Big Ten Network. And in the break, uh, I heard you guys, you and John talking. Uh, you were mentioning some of the people you've worked with at uh, BTN, and that you're being joined by John Beeline. Which is which is pretty cool, but uh, you're you're listing off all your your peeps, man. You're at the top there too, so uh, don't there ain't nobody on there that you're listing that uh, is higher than you are. I was describing them as hoopers, though, uh, so I am definitely on the low end. <laughs> you the I am not an all-time Big Ten great. Let's be honest. Uh, an all-time Big Ten great in other ways. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually and the only representative from Indiana on there, the state of Indiana. Uh, no, uh, Ray Fell well, is it? Indiana. Well, Ray Ray Fell and uh, Robbie. Hunt, well, no, Robbie's not there anymore. I guess. Well, no, he's still with us. All, and and I have done the shows with him, so he would. I left him out in in that recitation of all the greats. See, it's just it's an amazing group of players and really people uh, that I've been fortunate enough to to uh, partner up with over the years. It, 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 I, I noticed, though, they, they, they stay close to Chicago with the people they choose. Uh, Robbie Hummel, of course, from Purdue, which is not far from Chicago. Ray Fell, uh, 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 Coach Weber. Uh, uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of all the guys. There's a lot of guys that are close. To there Michigan. are, uh, but we've had, I mean, <clears throat> when I started uh, – Jimmy was coming in from Columbus, Jimmy Jackson, and, and Steve Smith was coming in from Atlanta, where he lives now. Uh, so it, so it, it, it's a it's a uh, mixture uh, of people from different areas, but all, uh, uh, you know, a lot, the uh, majority of the players, if not all of them, were Big Ten greats. Uh, and and believe me, they, they have been phenomenal to me. Uh, uh, can't ever thank them enough for accepting me into their into their uh, situation because I, I neither played nor did I attend a Big Ten school. So uh, 
it's it's been it's been a real honor to be a part of that. Um, Jess settles. Jess played for Iowa, right? He did. Jess played for Iowa. I was telling the story in the in the break that I tease him all the time because when I I used to go to the Nike All American Camp here in Indianapolis at IUPUI. It was an important part of me becoming a basketball writer. To, to, I, I literally spent my vacation time uh, at the at the All American Camp, the Nike Camp, and I, I think it was '93. So it was my third time coming, um, and I remember Jess was the first player in all in my three years there, and and I think maybe the last. Although it got it got a little bit more popular, he had a cheering section. Uh, his family was in the in the stands, and it was so funny to watch them, you know, cheer every great play he made. But Jess was the hardest playing guy at the Nike camp in all my years with the, the only player who was on his level in terms of energy was Kevin Garnett. And Kevin just happened to be 6'11 and could jump over the rim. Uh, Jess was a great athlete, but he wasn't KG. Uh, so it helped KG a little bit more to be playing as hard as he did. Yeah, and uh, Jess has been with us on the on the program before, but uh, he is a, he's a farmer. Yeah, he is a, a real life mm -hmm. day working living farmer, and I love that. Um, a guy I can see him climbing off of his tractor, going in the house, and uh, getting ready and heading off to do a a, a BTN broadcast. Yeah, I you know I I think it it calms down a little bit around the time we're hooping. Uh, the the farmer the farmer in Iowa doesn't have quite as much. Uh, uh, I, they still have lots to do, but they don't have as much uh, tilling and plowing and seeding and all and harvesting as they do in the in the uh, spring to fall region. Uh, that's why, like my wife, who works for the Indiana Farm Bureau, just came back from the state convention. Uh, in in uh, Fort Wayne uh, just over the weekend because that they 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 have those conventions in December because the farming is a little bit less active so so that's when he that's when he has time to spend with us uh, calling games and such and he's a great guy and a great friend uh, is super guy um, Pittsburgh and the Colts get it yeah. all uh, had last Saturday and uh, the Colts win a a huge game for them but. It was not obviously a, a great game for Pittsburgh. I know uh, you, you don't have many teams because you're in the media, but you're allowed to have one some. And Pittsburgh, the Steelers are. Uh, that's we're not used to seeing this from the Steelers, and because they are the most consistently successful program in the NFL, uh, maybe aside from. No, it's not aside from New England because New England has, did it in between. Pittsburgh has been doing it from the 70s. So they they are probably the most consistently winning program uh, organization that there is. So whenever we, we, we see them down, it's it's shocking. Yeah. Well, they 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 have not uh they, they made a couple of mistakes. Uh Hiring Matt Canada as an offensive coordinator, we talked about before, was not qualified to be an NFL offensive coordinator uh, and, and, and coach like it. Uh, that was a significant mistake. Keeping him for the sake of stability when they had a second-year quarterback, keeping him so that the quarterback didn't have to learn – Kenny Pickett from Pitt didn't have to learn a whole new offense in his second year, that was, that was a significant mistake because – the offense just was so uh, rudimentary. And you see that now. I mean, Joe Flacco can come off uh, 12 weeks of inactivity, but he joins an offense that has some degree of sophistication and he's able to be successful. If he was if he was uh, coming off that layoff and then handed the Steelers reins, it, it, would, it may not have been as bad as what Mitch Trubisky delivered on Saturday, but it still wouldn't be good because the offense isn't designed to be good. And then second... The, the, may, the bigger problem right now is that they've just been devastated by injury. They, they've lost two of their three rotational linebackers. Uh, they've lost their starting safety. Uh, they had uh, one of their safety suspended for the year uh, because of a hit that, that occurred on Saturday. Uh, they have had uh, their, uh, their quarterback, of course, is hurt now, Kenny Pickett. So they, it, it, it's, 
the, the problems that they have now are rooted in those two elements. And so they've lost three games in a row. It's it probably not going to get better uh, unless unless uh, they find a way around those injuries. Mika Fitzpatrick, their their all pro safety is not going to play again on Saturday when they play the Bengals at home. So it's just not a good situation. But I, I will say, Jim, my my, my wife uh, got me tickets uh, for uh, the game on Saturday, and obviously it was not a pleasant. It was a wonderful, delightful thing for her to do. Uh, and it was, it was not the best occasion getting up 13, nothing, and then watching the uh, opposition score 27 consecutive points. And I know that it got to 30, but I wasn't around for the last three. (laughs) No, I did not stay. Uh, but, uh, I I will say this. And I, I, I said this on Twitter yesterday, Indianapolis Colt fans are the most pleasant fans in the entire NFL. I mean, it is, un- I, I have been now since, for whatever reason, since uh, we moved here, the Steelers have played here, I think, four times or five times. And we've been to all of them. Uh, we've been to each of the, so we, it, there were two, I think it's it's either four or five that we've been to. And every single time, even though you're wearing the opposing team's gear, there's no confrontation. There's no bad words. There's... It, the, the, the Colts fans are amazing that way. I read something earlier in the year um, when the Colts played at Jacksonville. Uh, I don't remember where I saw it. Maybe it was Twitter, Facebook, could have been wherever. Uh, Jacksonville fans commenting on how delightful the visiting Colts fans were. Well, they're just as great at home. They are so pleasant. And, and, and that's the way it should be. I mean, there have been other stadiums, and I won't name them just to be kind, Oakland, Where, Alameda, Oakland, Alameda County. No, Stadium? I've, not, I've never been to one of those, but uh, my wife one time was struck with a pom pom uh, because we had rooted for the Steelers. And then the other team scored a last second touchdown. The woman in front of in front of her turned around, hit her with a pom pom. We've had beer spilled on us that, that got hassled uh, on the way out of the stadium. Those kinds of things have happened. And but never here, never in Indianapolis. It's all I, honest to goodness. There was a play. The Steelers were down. I can't remember. Maybe it was 24 to 13. I can't remember. They were down. They were, you know, they were still in the game, but they were out. And um, Trubisky completed a pass to uh, George Pickens. A really nice catch. He, he caught the ball seated on his butt. And the guy sitting next to me gave me a fist pound. He was a Colts fan. He gave me a fist pound. He said, nice play. Never going to happen. In, in the average NFL stadium. I'm not going to say no other NFL stadium, but not the average one. I think you have to you have to say that the Colts fans are the kindest in, in the entire league. And, and I wonder why that is, because they are also the most lo- one of the most loyal. They are there all the time, no matter what they were going through in the last couple of years. They still showed up and showed out. Um, and it's weird because it's not like they just got the team. They've been there since 1984, uh, since the midnight. Uh, I, I don't know what day it was, midnight that they arrived or 4 a.m. that they got there. But um, it's like that they're it's like they're just as happy today as they were in 1984 when that team arrived. And one crazy. theory, in addition to that, is that they're never cold. OK, that helps. <laughs> it's so pleasant being inside Lucas Oil Stadium on a 40 degree day or a 30 degree day or a 20 degree night to Thanksgiving, 2016, whatever it was, they're never cold. So that helps. It's a beautiful place to watch a game. It's uh, it's, it's so well designed and, uh, and so pleasant inside there. I think that, I think that helps a little bit. If you're, cause you're not miserable cause your team's trailing by 10 points and it's 20 degrees and snowing. And the Colts now uh, take a step closer to uh, being an official playoff team. They are they are solidly in the wild card picture as it was, as was Pittsburgh. Uh, both teams were tied with the same record, and now Pitts, or, uh, the Steelers, the Steelers, the Colts get win that game and move ahead. Which again, they're they're playing with their backup quarterback. Don't forget. Uh, so, what a, a, a somewhat surprising season for the Colts, I guess say. Oh, absolutely. And I think they're doing a terrific job and their schedule is favorable, although there's kind of no such thing in the NFL. You never know what you're going to 
come up against. But you do know, like if you were playing the Niners and the Eagles and the Cowboys, that it would be much more difficult than going on the road to play the Falcons. Again, weather won't be a factor there. Uh, then, then they come home for the final two against the Colts and Texans. That, I mean, excuse me, against the Raiders and Texans. And both of those teams are capable. Like I said, there's almost nobody in the NFL that can't beat you. Uh, it, we've seen that over the weeks. Uh, it, it, if, you, if you don't play well, you're going to get beat no matter who it is, as long as they're wearing an NFL uniform. But it's a favorable schedule relative to what they could be facing. They get to play at home. They don't have to deal with weather for any of their final three games. All three games will be indoors. I think that's a, a decent place to be in. And, and, and maybe number one on the whole of that is they don't have to go to Jacksonville again because we know how that goes. Yeah, it doesn't work out well. Uh, we've got to take a break. We've got Mike DeCourcy with us. Lots more coming up. Indiana plays tonight against Moorhead State. We'll talk about that a lot more when we come back. We'll be club. right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Sorry, I got a little button happy. No, I that's me. Hey, dude, anytime that happens, it's it's just one of the because I, I know that uh, that's a hard thing to not do. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you weren't around last night for the end of the Seahawks game. No, I did not watch that game. How did that go? Uh, the Seahawks win in the last minute. The Philadelphia had kind of controlled wow. that game for the most part. And, man, the Seahawks get I'm going at the end and, and score. What a pass. What a catch in the corner of the end zone in under a minute. Uh, it, was, it was a fun game to watch, even well, though it wasn't. I was going to say the Eagles media have been really, really harsh on on how they've played, and that this now they'll really hit the. Well, season. now that I've lost, I think they've lost three in a row now. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think the Seahawks had lost three or four in a row before the game last night. Well, who who quarterbacked the Seahawks last night? I know Geno Smith has been hurt. Did he? Uh, he Lock was it Lock? Ah, Drew Lock. Okay, yeah. I think he found out like five minutes before the game or something that he was quarterbacking. And, uh, but yeah, but that, the throw, the, the winning throw and winning catch, I was like, wow, it was perfect. Great. The catch might be, might've been better than the throw, which the throw was perfect. Uh, one of those throws where you put it in a place where only the receiver could catch it, but, and he had to make an unbelievable catch. It was on his fingertips and he barely was able to get it in. Uh, as he was going out of bounds, he did. So it was pretty fun to watch. Yeah, I needed some sleep, and I'm working on my bracket. And let me tell you, it's a hard, putting a bracket together is a hard job. There are they want to expand the tournament. Let them let them do my bracket uh, for a couple of days, and then tell me they want to expand the tournament because there are not 68 teams right now that look like tournament teams. I can tell you that. Is any what, what where where is Indiana right now? Are they in or out? Technically, I can't say because it's not <laughs> released yet. Okay, I can tell you it's close. I feel like well, Indiana's I, in the I, same. I would have. I would have assumed not, I would have assumed nothing less than that. I feel like they're in the same position they were in in Mike Woodson's first year because they didn't really have any marquee non-conference wins. I remember they beat Notre Dame, and that ended up looking better down the line. Right. But other than that, they didn't really have any big non-conference wins. Yeah, Saturday would have been big. It would have been an easy choice to put them in. Oh, yeah. Based, based oh, yeah. on the competition and, and, you know, if they had they had finished that one off and they were really close. <laughs> All right, here we go, guys. That you're making the right choice with Garnish Catering. Visit GarnishCatering.com. That's GarnishCatering.com. Garnish Catering is a proud partner of Wow Food Group. This segment is brought to you by Remax Advanced Realty, Indie Home Pros team by Cheryl Sizemore. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. 
Hey, welcome back. Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday, December 19th, Christmas week or week before Christmas. La 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 la. Mike DeCourcy with us from the Sporting News. So there's your present. Open it slowly. <laughs> um, Mike, uh, in, in college basketball, the uh, what a weekend last week was, last Saturday was. Uh, we went through uh, the week of, of finals. So there's nothing, there was basically nothing going on. And which is hard to take for college basketball fans, used to a a, a constant a, a assortment, a menu of games. But then, buddy, when Saturday came, it was like, well, let's just bring out all the the, the steaks and the fillets and everything all at once from a, a game perspective. Indiana, of course, hosting Kansas, Purdue, in essence, hosting Arizona, uh, Kentucky, and North Carolina. Uh, I, I'm, and I'm sure there are many others that I'm not even thinking of right now, but the Indiana-Kansas game, uh, a really, really good game. It, it was a great opportunity for Indiana to get that quote-unquote statement win that they do not have on their resume and is going to be difficult now to get. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I think that depends on what Michigan State does because they only play them once, and that's at the end of the season at home. So it, the, if Michigan State comes back around like they kind of tend to do with, with Tom Izzo and become back up to being a, a, a higher-ranked team, Purdue, we know they're back to number one, so that's an opportunity. Illinois is uh, probably another opportunity, maybe Northwestern. Other than that, I, I don't know that they have a shot of getting what – that quote unquote statement win the rest of the year. Well, I think you 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 have to look at Ohio State, Wisconsin, uh, Nebraska to an extent. You've got two against them. I think those are all victories that would matter significantly if the Hoosiers could get them. I, I think that I think people sometimes overestimate like if you don't get an important non-conference win that looks good, then oh gosh, you know, what are we going to do? Well what it does is it recalibrates your league. It means, okay, well, you didn't do great in non-conference in terms of collecting significant victories, so now you have to do better in your league. You can't go 500 in this year's Big Ten with this with with this uh, level of achievement for IU and get in. It's it's all it's not impossible, but it's highly unlikely that that will be good enough this year. The Big Ten's achievement out of conference hasn't been great. It's better after Saturday. Saturday was a big day for the for the conference. They had a lot of significant wins, had an opportunity to get one more, did not. And that's why IU sitting there discussing what they need to do. But they they can go out. If they play like they did on Saturday, they're going to beat a lot of teams. Uh, they're going to beat a lot of teams in the Big Ten. You can't play uh, like you did against Louisville and beat many teams in the Big Ten. Now, I mean, I know they got the win in that game, but they weren't good that night for most of it, at least maybe till the last 15 minutes or so. But that's not going to beat many good teams in the Big Ten. But la but Saturday's effort's going to beat a lot of them, if not most of them. Certainly in Assembly Hall, if they put that level of performance out, they're going to beat most of them. So I, I, I think it still is about continuing to grow as a team. And 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 again, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough that, the, I, if Xavier Johnson's able to come back soon, they, they become a different team in a lot of ways and, and, and should be a significantly better one. Uh, absolutely. And I, and I think that uh, how much he would have mattered last Saturday, we can only pontificate on, but I, I certainly think that that would have made a huge difference, but they played well enough to win that game, except they, it was just the last five minutes of that game that they lost it in. Uh, and it's, it's hard. It's hard for them uh, to deal with that. I'm sure because when you play that hard for, for that long and more importantly, they did it with a, a shrunken um, rotation, which had been uh, something that was been brought up to, to Mike Woodson more than once. And he would, was kind of bristling at it. Anytime someone would bring that up and, um, but he stretched it where where he, his guys played a ton of minutes 
but the same one what was this, it was the same for for Kansas uh if you looked over there they had uh, four guys i think that played 36 minutes or more right so it, it, it's the same thing those guys are not coming off the floor well they don't have a deep team they have a four man team right now that, that's the reality. That's Kansas. And that's why I've expressed some question about how good they are now. Now, whether or not they can eventually get from some of their bench players some level of high-end comp, uh, contributions, I don't know. But you, it's going to be hard to go through league play playing four guys for 35 minutes plus. It's, it's, it's not. It, it's just the, the games come too fast. In the Big 12, they're highly competitive. They need more from their bench than they're getting. I, I think for IU, the problem that they ran into uh, was that not having Xavier Johnson, I, I said this before, it weakens your bench. Not Because I thought that Gabe Cups did a great job of defending uh, the point guard spot. Uh, Dewan Harris is a terrific player. He was, he, he was a very, he was very good, solid again, but he wasn't, he wasn't controlling the action in the way that he often does until late in the game. I, I thought that uh, that with, when Cups is able to come off the bench, they they need less minutes from their other guys. I thought I thought Caleb Blank Banks committed four fouls in that game, and if you went back and watched the tape, bad fouls. They were bad fouls. Every one was so punitive. It's like uh, there's two seconds left on the shot clock, and you're fouling, or you're fouling a guy that's making a shot, or whatever it was. But I remember every single foul that he committed, it was like, ooh, that one hurt. It, 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 you know, you can foul in a game and it not be punitive, but he just happened to be in a spot where every time he got called for a foul, it really hurt the Hoosiers. And maybe that doesn't have – maybe he doesn't have to play as much uh, in that game if, uh, if Cups is coming off the bench and Xavier's your point guard. Everything, you, you don't know how well everything else would have gone because Gabe played really well and the offense was flowing and all of that. But I just think that injury is underrated by a lot of, especially people who follow college basketball. You just you, you can't go pick somebody up off the waiver wire when you have an injury in college basketball. Uh, you probably, especially in today's day, day and age, you can't have two guys who are starting quality at a place like at a position like point guard. Because they won't stay. They're, they're, if, if, there's, if there's two of them, one of them is going to transfer. So it's really hard to be deep. So if you, if you happen to be one of the unfortunate teams that gets injured, you're in trouble. And that's true all the way up. Like, like if Kansas lost one of their four, where would they be? They've got four terrific players, outstanding players. But it gets really thin after that. If they lost one of their four, they would be in big trouble. And I think that's true of every team in college basketball. I think Purdue probably has the has the least problems with depth of most teams. Uh, but it, even they, you, you, there are certain players you wouldn't want uh, to be missing. Yeah, and Indiana is, is not only missing Xavier Johnson now and will continue to miss him for an extended period of time per Mike Woodson. Uh, we don't know when that be, will be. Ja'Kai Newton has not seen the court. Uh, that's a huge loss. And they have an open scholarship on top of that that they weren't able to fill with another guard spot. So that that right there just tells you that's that's where Indiana is missing so much where they, they, they would normally be able to put on the floor. Yeah, I, 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 I said this before. There's no team in college basketball that can afford – an injury to a rotation player without being significantly affected. And right now it's, it's I use misfortune to be in that position. And I thought that they did a great job on Saturday of fighting through that. They played a really good game. It, they, what they have to, what they have to do is not be discouraged by the fact that that game that they delivered, they, they executed great at both ends of the floor I think Trey Galloway, the number of layups he was able to get on Kevin McCullough, who's considered one of the better defenders in college basketball. I mean, it, he just absolutely lit him up on Saturday. They have to go. They have to carry that through into their subsequent games and, and continue to, to execute at that level. Because in order to overcome the absence of the players that they're missing, they have to execute at a high level. They're not a good enough shooting team. 
it, to, to overcome it just by wailing in threes. Uh, but they can execute at a high level and force teams to guard players on the cut, uh, to deal with the post that they have multiple options in. Uh, there are things that they can do really well. It seemed like Indiana, their offense in general was a, a lot better and different, more open, more, more with more spacing against Kansas. Uh, it just seems like they were just a little more free flowing than they had been. Not for trying to force the ball I- inside, which part of that was because of Kansas was taking Kalel Ware away, and that was that was their plan, and and it, and it kind of worked. But it seemed like either that or Indiana opened up the offense to make it a little more uh, free-flowing. And like you said, Trey Galloway just torched uh, Kansas, getting a career high. And uh, he did phenomenal phenomenal uh, from the field. Uh, most of the guys shot the ball well. But it wasn't ju- quite enough as down the stretch, Kansas came alive. The one thing I have to say about uh, Hunter Dickinson is – he just did not get frazzled. No matter what was going on, no matter what the crowd was throwing at him, and I don't mean literally, I meant booing and all that, he never got frazzled. He had an air ball um, and didn't matter. He didn't get frazzled. Kansas didn't get frazzled. No, they they hung in there without a doubt. I think a lot of that comes from Harris, uh, some from K.J. Adams. Those guys have played in a ton of games and won a ton of games for Kansas. Uh, they they both uh, were on very su- a very successful team last year along with McCuller. Uh, so I think that that veteran uh, that veteran experience that they have with those three guys really makes a difference. And then Dickinson, he 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 knows that he looks around, and he sees guys who've won conference championships. Uh, they've they've they, in, in Harris's case. Uh, he's won a national championship. I believe KJ was on that team, but wasn't the high rotation player. But Harris was the starting point guard on a national champion. And and he was a significant con- contributor to that. So that I think that helps Hunter a lot to, to know he's playing with that level of experience. A year ago, he was playing with a high level of talent, but the, t- the experience and the, and the, the, understanding of how to win wasn't there with his teammates a year ago that now he knows is, is around them. And I think that's, that plays into why he's able to remain as calm as he is. How important is it for Indiana to make the tournament this year, being that this is Mike Woodson's third season, uh, having gotten a team into a play game and then gotten into the regular tournament last year, uh, to have a drop off would be seen as a drop off. Well, I think it's I think it's important because they have a team that's good enough. I mean, they they have enough talent to do it. Again, it when that talent isn't all on the floor, you're impacted. But when you have players like Ware, who's playing at a really high level, and Baco's coming along, uh, Renew is is getting better and better, and Trey, who's played so much basketball for IU. I think you look at that as the core of a team that ought to be good enough to make it. It it, it would be better if they had had the full complement of players all the way through this non-conference, and they haven't, uh, and and that's had an impact. So I think it would. I, I don't think it would be disastrous. Uh, that's not how programs work. Not not the ones that are successful. Uh, it, it's but it, I think it would be disappointing for IU fans because they know they're so close. Uh, and because there's there's there is enough talent there if if they have the depth to go with it if I, again I don't know what Xavier's circumstance will be how how long we're going to have to wait to see him back out there but the longer it goes the less the less they are built like a tournament team because you you don't have a point guard who you expect to be running uh, full time thirty minutes a game. A, a tournament team. And Gabe Cups wasn't recruited to be that. He was recruited to to play off the bench this year. And in that role, he did very well early. Uh, and if you watch how he's played as a starter, it's it, it's obvious that he would be very well suited to playing 18 to 20 minutes a game and would be contributing very well if that were the case. Uh, Purdue, obviously, back up to number one in the latest AP poll. 
if they don't win a national championship this year, I, I, I don't know that they when when the big e the the big Edie, that's that should be his nickname the big Edie. Uh man, did I am I am I the only one that's ever said that? The big as far Edie? As I know. I've that's, never heard it before. That's kind of cool. Uh it is cool. I like that. I, I do too. I'm like, oh man, if I was him, I would get that right now. The big <laughs> Edie. Instead of the big easy. Um if they don't win a national championship this year, that's got to be um for for Matt Painter, tag on. Uh, if you can't win it with, with a team like that, that has been so dominant. And if he, especially if he ends up being the back-to-back -back player of the year, that's, that's going to be a, a kind of a black mark on Matt. I think. I don't know about winning it for me. I, I think getting to the final four is kind of the threshold for them in part because they haven't made it since 80 and they haven't made it under Matt. They didn't under Gene. Uh, I think that's I, so. I think the Final Four would be a huge accomplishment for for Purdue. And also, I I I will say that I, I don't know if we've talked about this before. I've, I talk about it a lot. I I in, in 1987, Indiana had zero had zero first round picks on their roster. And won a national championship. You know how many times it's happened since 1987, Jim? Zero. Zero. Probably. That is correct. It has not happened since. And I, I and I, I shouldn't say on the roster. I mean in the rotation. I mean actively helping the team. I'm not talking about some freshman who never played. Um, I'm talking about actively helping the team. And I, right now, I don't see that player active in Purdue's rotation unless it's Miles Colvin. And there are times when he's not active. He did not play. He played a lot in the Alabama game and made a big difference. He did not play as much in the Arizona game, in part because Fletcher Lawyer was playing so well. Uh, but I don't, unless that player is Miles, I don't know who it is. And I, I know that sounds like a uh, maybe like a uh, like a silly reason to not believe a team can win a national championship. But it's thirty five years of history. I mean, that's a lot of that's a lot of basketball and nobody's been able to do it. And I, I, I can count in, on every single time that we've seen a team win it, it. There's always that guy who makes a difference, because as I say, like if you get it, when you're playing the Maui Invitational, you've got like eight hours to scout before you have to play again. But in the NCAA tournament, at the beginning of the tournament your your co your your coaches have four days to scout get ready for that game then you got to get ready in two but you're staying up all night to get everything picked apart uh to make sure that there's every single piece of film you've watched one of your coaches has probably been assigned to scout the uh to scout Purdue in that second game and again if you're at the uh, elite eight level uh and so it, it, you need that guy who just can go out there and do something that nobody can take away and that's where that having those NBA first round picks usually comes in to make a difference. And that's why I, I think Purdue has a great team. I think there's a very good chance they make the final four, but I've never been solidly behind them as a likely national champion for that reason. But they are the best team in the country. Uh, it, the best team in the country doesn't always win it, but that's who they are right now. Uh, and we've got 30 seconds left quickly. Uh, Eric Montross passing away yesterday. Uh, just gut-wrenching, a, a former uh, player here in the state at Lawrence North, winning an, a state title with Todd Leary and then going on to North Carolina to win a national championship. He was part of their, their broadcasting crew and very, very beloved uh, in Chapel Hill. But just uh, shocking and, and just it's hard to take. Super, super incredible, great, great guy. And this is on the heels of, of the state losing George McGinnis. So uh, two good ones. Yeah, I, I got to know Eric uh, through his role as a broadcaster for the Tar Heels and, and spoke to him several times over the years. And he was always so kind and so nice. If I saw him at a game, it was, it was always a pleasant exchange. Just a lovely man and, and a great champion on multiple levels. And to lose him at 52 is just devastating. I knew he was ill. I did not know it was this bad. 
Um, I don't think a lot of people did. I think they kept that pretty private. They didn't. They weren't. They didn't keep it a secret that he was ill. But I, I, I wish I'd known that he was. He was that he was this. Uh, that it was this bad because I would have loved to have you know sent a note. Uh, uh, he just. He. He just was an amazing person, and uh, you know, teach us all a lesson. Reach out to the people that you know that are in in a tough way because. That's one I'm going to regret not having done so. I, I should have. He was he was just a lovely person. Well, uh, Mike, we appreciate you so much, man. And I hope you have a great week and a happy holidays. Merry Christmas and enjoy your uh, your your, uh, your festivities this weekend. Happy holidays to you, Jim. To everybody at uh, everybody that listens to Sports Beat Radio, really appreciate you having me uh, in each week. Absolutely. It's a, it's a present for us. It's our big, a big present. Hey, we've got lots more coming up here on Indiana Sports Beat Radio. We're back with it in the next hour right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented hey, by Ralph Food one Group second. and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. In the- um, next week, we are off on Tuesday. So Good news. if you want to come on with us. Okay, I yeah. was going to ask the bail if that were possible, so I guess okay, it is. yeah. So yeah, if you if you can't do any, any other day next week, that's fine. But we'd also love to have you on. Uh, let me look Friday. here. Uh, let me see something real quick. Um, I didn't uh, even know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did, my or Jim. We talked about that the other day. I'm how, how is Thursday? How how is Thursday? I th- at your normal time. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, that, that should be fine. Thursday. Oh, great. Okay. We'll do that. Terrific. We, we were having Stephen Bardo on at that time, but he's so busy. He can't come on regularly with us. Okay. So, so we're going to do Thursday at eight 50. Yes. Okay, great. Well, happy holidays to you, John. Thank you. Yes, sir. You too. All right. Take care. Yeah, Jim, you knew we were off next Tuesday. We've talked about that at least twice now. <laughs> we can talk about it four times, and guess what? <laughs> oh, I know. It's Monday, because remember, we're, you're going to do a show Friday, but we're going to take off Monday and Tuesday. We were discussing whether we were going to do Friday and Monday off or Monday and Tuesday off, and we decided Monday and Tuesday. Somebody Uh, is this an open break or we have some? Yeah, this is open. And then uh, Chronic is up next. Yeah. And then Nye's like supposed to be after that. I haven't heard from him yet. I've reached out to him, so we'll see. How much time do I have? Uh, about a minute. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Oh, man. <clears throat> All right, here we go, Jimbo. We have several lots available with scenic views of the golf course. Contact Amy Rhoda with Rebest Co. Real Estate for additional information. 812-583-0919 or go to MyStoneCrestLiving.com. That's MyStoneCrestLiving.com for more details. This segment is brought to you by Bubba's 33 in Clarksville and Evansville. Pizza, burgers, beer. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle. Presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Speed Radio here on this Tuesday of Christmas week. 
la 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 la. What uh, what are some of your big Christmas items? Christmas wish list for sports. That's what I should ask. What? Uh, it's a good question. See, my, the the Christmas present I want for sports can't come around until next fall, and it's I just want Indiana football to be relevant. I think that's the biggest Christmas wish I want for sports. Is just and, and it seems like we're on the right track for that. Um, hopefully it's not fool's gold, but if there's, if I could have one sports wish for any team that I, that I root for, it's that Kurt Signetti gets this Indiana football program rolling. We're going to get back to that, but I was going to look up something on, on, uh, on my phone here on ESPN and there's a video of something that I'm like, wait a minute, what the hell is this? Uh, it's being played on a court the size of a tennis court indoors, and it's the Pro Kabaddi League. Have you heard I don't of know this? Is. I have no clue well, what that is. I've never heard or seen of this, but there are. I, I this is weird, man. I don't even know what they're doing. I don't see a a ball, but it's it kind of looks like rugby in a, it, I, I don't know what the, I, I'm going to have to study that. Um, I'm going to have to ask our Fozan you're on or You were on here. What, what is, what is the pro Kabaddi Kab league? Anyone know what about that? Um, I'm going to have to Google that. Man, what is pro Kadati? I feel like you're saying a different word every time you try to pronounce it. I don't, I don't know what. what well, it is. For one, I don't know what the hell it is. I've never seen or heard of it. Yeah, Kabati. It's K A B A D D I. That, uh, right, Kabati game. Uh, there is a pro Kabati league. Where I don't know where this takes place. Um, this is nuts. Look it up, people. It's Kabaddi is a contact team sport played between two teams of seven players originating in ancient India. Demonstration sport at the 1936 Olympics. So it's not like it's just me that's, uh, but then it brings up the people search for all the different things below that I'm like, okay, I've never, you know, it's got like high lying in there, which I know what that is, but then there's Karash, CPAC, Tay Crowd. So there's so many sports around the world that we don't even know. That I don't even know exist. Um, the rules of Kabaddi. In Kabaddi, teams take turns sending players called Raiders across a midline to the other team's side to the court. The Raider tries to tag members on the other team and run back to his side within 30 seconds. Each player he touches equals one point for the team if he makes it back safely. <laughs> oh, never seen that before. That's crazy. Um, speaking of Kabaddi, Kurt Signetti, just kidding. Not a good segue. But, uh, yeah, Kurt Signetti looking for Christmas come early tomorrow as National Signing Day happens. Indiana will have a um, an official announcement of everything tomorrow afternoon. We'll have all of that on Thursday for you. But I'm expecting a big signing day for, uh, for Indiana. Lots of excitement around the program without question. A lot of commitments. A lot of guys that are coming back. So a lot of a lot of the news won't be on that. But um, JMU's highest commitment ever commits to Indiana on Monday. So they're pulling in talent that uh, they probably wouldn't have had. They're getting back talent that they did have. 
it's going to be interesting to see what uh, Indiana ends up with. But this Jaja Boyd that was JMU's previously highest commit ever, now following Kurt Signetti to Indiana, he's a four-star. Uh, Kurt Signetti is doing a phenomenal job, but why would you not? I mean, that was a given that he was not going to go to uh, JMU once Signetti left, but um, Boyd played for Roman Catholic High School in Pennsylvania and offers from several big schools, but he knocked it down to IU and Pitt as his finalist taking uh, IU. He's a safety and wide receiver in high school, was recruited to James Madison as a two-way player. Very interesting. Is you know that we saw that last year with Colorado and uh Dion. There's hardly ever a two-way player in, in, in college football these days. But to see that last year at Colorado and the success that uh what, what dang it, was that kid's name, John? Oh, Travis Hunter. Travis Hunter. Uh Man, he was good on both sides of the ball. I mean, it's you don't see that a lot just because of of, of what it takes out of you physically to play both sides, especially being a, a receiver and a, a DB. But Jaja Boyd, one of those type players, I don't know if he'll be a two-way player, but I would not be surprised that we would see that, and that would be kind of uh, unique. It wouldn't be kind of unique. It would be unique. And it would also be something that brought attention to Indiana, Indiana football, which is not uh, something they're they're used to. How much more attention does Indiana get now on, on the football side? Not, not tomorrow um, because you're still going to be behind – a lot of these teams as far as the recruiting classes and where they're ranked and all that. But Signetti doesn't care about that. He only cares about getting the guys that he wants, that he thinks are, uh, are even Fozan has no idea about that. I think uh, I, Fozan, you've made me feel not as dumb as I felt a minute ago. But I think Indiana is going to – I don't care where the rankings come out. And I know Kurt Signetti does not care where the rankings come out. He cares that he gets the guys that he thinks can play for him. And I like that. Uh, first of all, you know, he has great confidence in the players. We've seen what he can do as far as playing with those types of guys. You, you can't get a program like James Madison ranked in the top 25 in football and not be good. But he did it with players that weren't your five stars, your typical five stars, your typical uh, Michigan or Ohio State, Penn State type of recruiting classes. Doesn't matter. We've seen that before, uh, and and I think you saw that a little bit with Tom Allen in the success in the, in those years of success that he had. You saw it back in the Bill Mallory era, but it's hard to compare anything like from the Bill Mallory era to today. Not because they weren't successfully and good and very good, because they were. They were competitive. Hell, they beat Ohio State two years in a row. They beat Michigan. So it's not that they weren't successful. There was not as much separation as there is today. So that's why that's not a, a, as great a comparison. But I, I think it's going to be extraordinarily interesting to see what Indiana can do next year in the football season. I, I think that they become a bowl team. And that's a somewhat stupid prediction to make at this time just because you're making it at this time. But – They've got eight home games. I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. They're not going to be the same old Indiana. It's not going to be the same offense. It's not going to be the same defense. It's going to be 
some of the same players with some other ones added in that are quite nice. But I think it's going to be a uh, an obviously differently run type program. Nothing against uh, uh, the wonderful man, Tom Allen. But uh, we'll talk about all that and more in our next segment. Chronic Hoosier joins us back with that right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. When- this might be the funniest name I've seen ever. Right here. <laughs> Loading. I like that. Morning crack. That is hilarious. What's going on? What's the name? Someone his, on his, the YouTube. His screen is, name is loading. Yeah, loading with the ellipsis at the end. Nice. Uh, I've never seen that. I think that is unique. And then his and picture funny. on, if you can tell, it's it's the headshot of Signetti with a cigarette in his mouth and some glasses and then a sweatband. That's hilarious, man. Great job for creativity loading. But of course, it's it's probably one of our normal listeners that we. Yeah, haven't. it could be somebody who just changed their their name. <clears throat> I, I gotta admit, I have taken a strange delight in seeing absolutely everybody leaning into the whole uh, the Sig meme. I know it's, it's super. I, I didn't think it would really catch on, but I think it's funny. This What's is like that? it's it's 1983 all over again, where we're Every, all just rocking Winston as openly team. as possible. Yeah. What was it, John? Yeah. All the football memes, like yesterday, one of the coaches, one of the assistant coaches, says something about it being a great day to be a Hoosier, and it was a photo of like a cannon with a bunch of cigarettes as like the bullets. That's or the kind rockets, of funny. I should say. Uh, one of them had generated. Somebody had an AI generated image that had a bison wearing an IU football jersey with the cigarette in its mouth. And it and there was <laughs> a PAX where so the 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 Marlboro logo where they'd put the Indiana on it and every it just leaning all the way into it. The cigarette emojis just even now, even uh, coach is, is is you know smoking and it's just it's tremendous. I've seen the funniest thing I've seen is Indiana's New Jersey and it looks like a pack of Marlboros. Yep, 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 yep. But it says Indiana where it says Marlboro in the same font. Yes, that's that was the image that was used in that that, that very bison meme I was talking about. It's just that's it's really everywhere cool. in the the recruits, the staff, obviously the fans, everybody's just leaning hard into it. And it's uh it, 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 I think it's just reflective of the enthusiasm. Um inside and outside of the program right now. And it's just, it's a tremendous departure from where we were, you know, a month and a half ago. Yeah, it is crazy. Hopefully not everybody's smoking a pack in the, in the stadium. That's the one thing I don't, I don't be smelling that tobacco all the time, but you know, that ain't, that ain't up to me. <laughs> so you don't have to worry about that. Hey, you and never know. I- People are going to try to do it anyway. I just hope we don't plan a, uh, well, you never know. I'll tell you what, when we go out to Washington, we go out to Oregon, ask Deion <laughs> Sanders what other uh, stadiums are like right now. It ain't Marlboro's you're smelling. Oh, yeah. Here we go. And Fish House, no matter where you live. This segment is brought to you by Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. Welcome back, Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday. Thanks a lot for being with us. Chronic Hoos are joining us now, and we were talking in the break about all of the uh, the different memes for Indiana football right now that have a cigarette reference to it because of Kurt Signetti. Um, which that's probably in this day and age, a cigarette is not the type of meme that uh, you would expect or or even want. But I I think that everyone is going with the joke and that it's not uh, having any kind of a negative connotation because it's pretty damn funny. I was telling Chronic, the one I've seen that really cracked me up is uh, Indiana's New Jersey's for next year. And it looked like a Marlboro box. Red and white with the Indiana and the font that Marlboro is written in, and 
He was talking about the one he, he saw with the bison, but uh, there are many. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because the other thing that you talked about and, and that I've seen is the unbelievable buy-in by the fans to what's going on in the Indiana football program. And they have not played a single second yet uh, under this regime, but yet the buy-in seems to be at a, an all-time high of like, like 70% or something of the fans are just buying into this right now. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, as we were talking on the break, you know, I, I, I'm taking just an unreasonable delight in seeing the way that the staff, the players, the recruits, the fans are leaning into the uh, the whole SIG memes and all the connotations with the cigarettes and everything else. Um, and I, I think it's, as we were saying, it's it's a welcome departure from the mood in and around the program here uh, throughout most of last season. Um, I, I think it's also uh, just such a departure for something <laughs> like IU. Uh, and it's a little thing, but it, it seems like it's representative of something bigger. You know, the whole cigarette thing in and of itself is very taboo in this day and age because obviously it's a, you know, a terribly carcinogenic habit. And, you know, I've, I, I myself have spent the better part of my adult life as a smoker no longer, um, but whatever. Uh, but Taboo stuff like that just doesn't get embraced at Indiana. We just don't do that. Indiana is so buttoned up and so conservative about everything. Um, it's it's just a very marked departure from what we've seen in the past. You know, we were we were talking about love and we were, you know, talking about all these religious connotations, and now we're all smoking, and it's just it's wild. But you know, a, a parallel on a completely different track. Now you have, uh, you know, you have a staff that in a very short period of time has been able to at least outwardly demonstrate a very clear vision and strategy on how they want to tackle the rebuild. And, you know, the enthusiasm you see in the memes and everything else uh, being reflected in the response uh, around the program, whether it's bringing back key pieces uh, that had entered the portal and returned, whether it's picking up new commits either through the portal uh, or, you know, through flipping some uh, some high school commits. Uh, it's just um, in a very short period of time, it feels like the program is doing a very radical 180 uh, from its prior trajectory. And, you know, quite frankly, uh, you love to see it. And I don't know that you could have asked uh, for a better response and a better turnaround in such a short period of time. I mean, it's it's hard to it's easy to forget rather that, you know, we're just a couple weeks into the, into the Kurt Signetti era. And, um, you know, for a roster that looked like it was going to be completely bare, uh, in very short order, uh, you know, now they've assembled a, a pretty deep and, um, and, and probably competitive quarterback room. You've got a wide receiver room. That's going to be among probably the top third, if not, you know, me, it's, it's going to be one of the tops in the conference, uh, quite honestly. And um, for a staff that is 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 very clearly uh, offensively minded and driven and competent, um, to see these pieces fall into place in such short order is, is really nothing short of remarkable. And quite frankly, smoking. Ha ha! No pun intended. All the uh, puns intended. We're in a punny <laughs> mood today. Uh, you, the two words that you said that stood out most to me in that offensively minded. Uh, that is something that I think Hoosier fans have wanted to see for a long time, for at least for seven years. Um, they haven't really been able to see that. There was a little blip there uh, when Kalen DeBoer and crew were here. But the, the talent that is not only that he's bringing in, but it's the talent that he's keeping along with that that really backs up everything. Because if you have these guys buying in, then – because they are, they have options and opportunities to go elsewhere. But when they are, when you got Trent Hallen and Donovan McCulley um, and and all of those guys that are coming that have changed their minds and are coming back, Donovan McCulley could have gone about anywhere he wanted to go, but he chose to come back and play for Kurt Signetti. That tells me a lot. No doubt, and you know that was that was one that uh, seemed like Michigan was real hot and heavy on, and had a very good chance of stealing them. Which you not only hate to see the loss of the talent, but to stay in conference is just a that's just a uh, you know compounds the 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 pain. 
So uh, it just huge, absolutely huge. And, you know, my concern throughout, um, you know, and my concern that's persisted for a couple of years now, several years now, uh, the offensive line, recognizing that in this conference, uh, especially in this day and age of college football, you've got to win the battle in the trenches if you want to have any luck um, elsewhere. And for them to, uh, to retain and, and continue to attract and build some strength in that. Now, the big challenge, I think, and where Indiana's lagged for a while, you can ask Kevin Wilson this, for a guy that put a lot of dudes in the league, building depth of talent is really the next level that they're going to have to break through. Uh, but it, again, it, it very much seems, outwardly at least, that you're seeing the results of, uh, of a clear and concise strategy uh, and the execution of that strategy and uh, the response that it's achieving uh it's desired outcomes so you know vision uh it, it's something that um you know we're certainly not privy to it although last night you know late night 11 o'clock uh coach sig is posting photos of his office and you know there's 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 some very very cleverly placed uh items across his desk and uh not the least of which is go get players and uh you know, for such a little glimmer as far as what's going on inside, uh, it's hard not to believe that this is a uh, a very concise, if not a brief, articulated plan. And uh, they're they're following the playbook that he's laid out. And um, you know, you've got to imagine uh, that that transcends uh, that you see that in in the practice, uh, well, especially in the weight room here between now and then, getting the bodies uh, up to speed. So that they're ready to compete and then see that translate onto the field here come the spring and then, uh, you know, ultimately in the fall. You mentioned the quarterback room that right now for Indiana, and that doesn't include the fact that Tyler Cherry is is about to, to decide between uh, Michigan State and Indiana with a quarterback's room that is kind of loaded already. Um, and and if he comes in, what what? What becomes of that thing? You're going to go from a, a room that was really limited to a what the hell do we do with all these guys kind of a situation. Well, you know, uh, the quarterback's one of those really, really tricky positions to get right uh, and to keep right because, you know, it's you look at USC, look all across, look at Ohio State for that matter. Um, you know, in this day and age of the portal, uh, which I think is also being fueled by staff changes and whatnot as well. Um, you know, you can, you can land a key, key piece to your offense. And then just as soon as the season closes, you're starting over from scratch again. And for a position that requires so much background work, understanding not just your offensive playbook, but defensive schemes, the lay of the land in your conference and whatnot. Uh, it, it's really, really difficult, not only to attract top talent that, that works with your system, but also have continuity of talent as uh, players matriculate in and out. So uh, you got to love a quarterback room or any position group room for that matter, where guys come into it yeah. knowing full well that they're going to be challenged and they're going to have to compete for the starting spot. They're going to have to compete for minutes and uh, their position on the depth chart. And you got to love guys that are willing to embrace that challenge knowingly up front. Uh, you know, how many times do you see a commitment uh, immediately followed by a decommit uh, because somebody felt like they're being stepped over in the, uh, in the process. Um, so, you know, it, we'll, we'll see what, uh, what it looks like that room looks like come spring ball and then come the season next year. Uh, but I'm assuming these guys, you, you have to believe they're being pretty upfront about what the expectations are uh, when these guys get on campus or if they choose to stay on campus and uh, what that's going to entail. And those that choose to stay, those that choose to compete, those are generally the dudes that you want to build your program around and uh, a few positions even more important than the uh, the quarterback. Yeah, and uh, Tyler Cherry, one of those guys, but also a former teammate of Taven Jackson. And that brings up the question, with all these guys coming in, what 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 becomes of, of Taven Jackson? Get better or get used to watching other dudes get the snaps. I, mean, I think it's pretty straightforward. And, uh, you know, if Taven's willing to stay and embrace the process and embrace the challenge and, uh, you know, earn those minutes, um, no matter where he falls in the depth chart, you have to imagine it's just going to make everybody in that room better at their position. Yeah, he uh, since he's already transferred from Tennessee, he does not 
at the current moment have the ability to transfer, but the way things are going with the NCAA and all the lawsuits uh, from guys that are trying to transfer a second time, uh, I think it's only a matter of time before that just goes by the wayside and you have complete free agency in college football, which I think would be a horrific mistake. But if, if it can't be stopped, uh, man, that, that really changes the game. And, and that, that sucks to me. But I think that the only way that I see around that is potentially can they can they do an NIL agreement that has a two year stipulation to it or something um, to that effect to, to try to minimize this just constant churning of going wherever the hell you want, whenever the hell you want. Brother, that's what we call freedom in America. We're free. Uh, coaches are free to do it. Administrators are free to do it. Let the kids, you know, and I think this is, I, I, I say that only half flippantly because I, I, I do think when the rest of the league, when the rest of the student body uh, has that freedom, the fact that you are playing NCAA sanctioned sports, uh, why should you have to lose that freedom? That being said, it's going to put a premium on programs and on coaches to develop relationships with a very clear understanding of what it's going to take to get on the field uh, or to earn a starting spot. And, you know, if there's kids that just feel like they're being passed over, so be it. You know, if, if the kid's unhappy at Indiana, you don't want to keep them at Indiana. You're not going to get the best out of them. And ultimately you want players that are willing to give you their best. And I think one of the things that's really fascinating about the quarterback, the quarterback room that they're building right now is there is a depth of classes, um, so that you have a natural progression forward. Uh, it's very rare to see a kid come straight out of high school who's going to be ready and capable of competing at the high level uh, demanded by Big Ten play. Uh, it's just, it's really, really tough. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's really tough. It's no different than, you know, what Gabe Cups is going through right now uh, on the basketball program. It takes time to build the mind and the body to be able to compete at that level. So when you can have... A, a diversity of classes uh, at a certain position, you have a progression. You know that your first year or two, you're going to come in here and you're going to have to learn the ropes. You're going to have to earn your stripes and you're going to have to earn the trust and the confidence of your, your, your staff and your teammates. And when the time is right, if you do the things, your day is going to come. And when you can get guys that are ready, willing, and able to buy into that from the jump, I think you avoid a lot of this stuff. Uh, I, I think, you know, the, the portal gets a bad name in large part because a lot of kids are promised the sun, moon and stars, um, you know, in the living rooms on the phone calls and they get to campus and then there's, they find out they've been sold a completely false bill of goods. That wasn't the plan for them. They weren't going to come in and be the starter from day one. They weren't going to just be given the keys to the castle. And uh, for kids who, who were promised that, and then they show up and they find something totally different. It's easy to understand why you would be uh, disenchanted with the process or the place that you've landed. Um, I, I think for staffs that are willing to be forthright and, you know, to make clear, clear mile markers and benchmarks in their progression. This is what it's going to take to get there. And, you know, make no mistake. They're aware of where they are on the totem pole. You know, you see that. I think a lot of times you see recruits come and visit and it's particularly a uh, prone in basketball where these guys get the chance to go do open gym and get some run with the current team. Everybody knows real quickly where everybody falls in the hierarchy of talent. And, um, you know, that's just natural selection, if you will, figuring out, hey, this isn't the spot where I'm going to come right in and get those minutes. Whereas if you see a guy that's a rising junior uh, who, you know, is really it looks like it's his time, you know that, hey, it's going to take a couple of years for me to get my body and my mind right to get the playbook down. Uh, but then come my sophomore, maybe junior year, I'm ready to step into that role. I think you're going to see programs that have better continuity over the classes uh, and ultimately are more successful because, you know, you look across the board, just like in basketball, football is no different. Uh, it's not always the teams that have the highest star ratings on their roster. It's the ones that have the most experience, um, the, you know, the most depth of talent. And uh, there, there are a few better teachers for that than just reps and guys that have many years under their belts, teams that are older tend to be a little bit more poised, a little bit more experienced, a little more capable of winning when the lights are brightest. 
Uh, speaking of minutes, uh, we saw minutes greatly extended for Indiana starters on the hardwood against uh, Kansas. And we saw the result, although it was did not come in a win, it came in a game that probably could have, should have, whatever you want to say, pop, very, very, very close to being a win against the what is ranked right now as the number two team in the country. Um, and that it, it, the fact that Woody was – Really poo pooing the the fact that uh, about his his choice or his way of uh, making the uh, the substitution pattern prior to that, all of a sudden he abandoned that, and the result was very positive. Even though they didn't win the game, they were leading Kansas for 80 percent of that game. Uh, but I think that that's something they're going to have to do. Although you can't do that every game, I understand that. You're, these guys are going to have to get a little bit of rest, but they're also going to have to play more minutes, and he's played them, uh, not the Kansas game aside. No, and I think that was uh, the rotation was pretty revealing as far as where Woody's trust is at this point in the season. You know, uh, CJ got a little bit of run. Uh, I think he, he he logged five minutes, but for the most part, that was basically a seven-man rotation. Uh, you know, you had the starters and then uh, Anthony Walker and Caleb Banks filling in uh, about 15, 16 minutes a piece. So um, I, I think that was that was very telling of where Woody feels like his depth of talent is right now. Uh, it's just not quite there, at least when it comes to, you know, being able to compete against a team like Kansas. And I think you saw the result of that when uh, Mbako got his fourth foul and had to sit, uh, how the momentum shifted away. Um, when, when, you know, one of your starters is a key starter ended up getting, uh, getting sidelined for a bit there. And that's really when, uh, you saw Kansas just proceed to make more plays in, in the clutch. So it's unfortunate to see them, uh, let a very, very winnable game go, let a very, very critical game go, uh, for a team that's got a pretty thin tournament resume right now. That was an opportunity lost, uh, to really put a marquee win on the board and, uh, stake a claim that they belong uh, come selection Sunday. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say the sky is falling and, you know, the end is, is here now. Uh, but I think the degree of difficulty during the conference season just increased pretty significantly, uh, having lost that game, having lost that very winnable game, uh, because quite frankly, the big Ten's is not that strong this year. And, uh, Indiana has, uh, has so far missed on those opportunities to post some good tournament wins. So, uh, it's unfortunate, but I, I think this could be, you know, and I, 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 I'm not willing to bet the mortgage on it just yet because uh, with Xavier Johnson's pending return here and his working back into form, I think there's still going to be some bumps in the road uh, as they try to figure out what the rotation is and what roles everybody's going to have to play. But, you know, you look at Trey Galloway's contributions, obviously a career game for him, uh, outstanding. But, you know, speaking back to that that experience and the value of that, um, having your senior captain play the best game of the year, the best game of his career, honestly, uh, when the team needed it most, um, you love to see it, quite frankly. You absolutely love to see it. Now you'd really love to see that uh, get repeated. And I'm not saying necessarily, you know, put up a 30 spot uh, every game, but being able to hit the shots that your team needs you to hit when they need you to hit them. And, um, you know, hopefully that spreads a little bit and hopefully that can carry on. Uh, because that's, you know, if you can't take that lesson from this game, that loss is for naught. Um, but I think it was good for the team. I think it was good for the fans and some of the pundits to see that this is a team that's capable of competing against the best talent. Uh, just unfortunately, there's not as many pieces as we thought that would be able to contribute to it. And, uh, you know, it's going to take some, some very high achieving efforts uh, in order for them to do it. But, you know, take, tape is a great teacher. You can run drills and practice till the cows come home. But once you see successes and failure on tape, uh, I think those lessons really set in a little bit better. Absolutely. Uh, so I go back to Todd, what Todd Leary would say, that once Big Ten play came around, they, they didn't practice nearly as hard as they watched film. And mm -hmm. they did a lot more of that than they did running practice. Uh, if Indiana is able to go uh, 500 in Big Ten play, Though they should win these next three games, obviously, Moorhead State, North Alabama, and Kennesaw State uh, before they get back into Big Ten play. But that would put them at 10-3. and three. And if they split 
50-50, their Big Ten games, 20 and 13. I, I think depending upon some of those wins, that's a tournament team. But the first Big Ten game they play in this second iteration of the schedule is at Nebraska. And Nebraska is not a, not never a pushover in Nebraska. No, no doubt. And, you know, you've got uh, – that's a tough stretch to start. Uh, you got to go to Nebraska. You got Ohio State at home. Then you got to go to Rutgers. Um, and you got a home match against Minnesota before you got the Boilers in town here. And that's all within the first two weeks of January. So uh, it, it's going to be, like I said, it's a very, very steep hill for them to climb right now. And quite frankly, they're going to have to hold serve at home, uh, if not perfectly, pretty darn close to perfectly. And they're going to have to figure out ways to go steal some road wins um, because. <laughs> That's just what it's going to take to get that net ranking up in order to get themselves, you know, back squarely on the right side of the bubble and firmly in the tournament here. And, uh, you know, great challenges present great opportunities. And uh, it, Lord knows there's some great challenges ahead here just in the first couple of weeks before you get into uh, into the real grind of February. Well, and it starts tonight as Indiana takes on Moorhead State at 630. So they'll be back at it. Chronic, can't thank you enough as always. Yeah, this is one of those games. We got a couple of them coming up here. Those break games can get funky, and Moorhead State's probably going to be the stiffest competition. So with no students in town, early tip time on a uh, on a work night, uh, we'll see. This is a uh, classic hangover game following the Kansas letdown. So hopefully they can uh, they can just roll through it, handle their business, stay healthy, and uh, get ready for the next one. But we'll talk to you guys next week about it. Chronic Hoosier brought to you by Andy Moore Honda. Appreciate you, brother. We've got lots more coming up here on Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Back with it right after this. We'll be right back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle, presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Moore Honda of Bloomington. In the John boy, John boy. You gotta get start getting Todd Golden back on as well. Yeah. yeah. I don't think nice that's gonna be on. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. USC did not have a great year last year. They had the reigning Heisman Trophy winner. The two Louisville plays in their bowl game. Uh, holiday, you know, in the Holiday Bowl matchup with uh, Louisville. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. Louisville's pumped up, fired up, grateful to be there. That reminds me of the Sugar Bowl. I saw Louisville play uh, Florida in the Florida. Sugar Bowl. Yeah. That that Florida was a I think a favorite then and they were the number three team in the country. Fans were just uh, all out and about you know, down on Bourbon Street and and I remember Teddy Bridgewater got hit right in the mouth right off of the beginning. He got hit so hard I can't remember if his helmet came off, but I think it might have. I mean, when I say hit in the mouth, literally got just 
Yeah. Didn't Florida throw a pick six on the opening play of the game or something like that? I can't remember, but I think on that play where he got hit in the mouth, I mean, just jock, jock. Yeah. It was a great play, though, for Louisville. All right, here uh, we go. Point in Bloomington. This segment is brought to you by Reynolds Family Dentistry in Sellersburg. Now back to the Golf Club at Eagle Point Studios for more Indiana Sports Beat Radio with Jim Coyle. Presented by Wow Food Group and Andy Morhonda of Bloomington. Welcome back to Indiana Sports Beat Radio here on this Tuesday. Thanks a lot for being with us. Christmas week. John Boy, I hope you've got all your uh, Christmas presents wrapped and ready. Uh, wrapped? No. I have done probably about two-thirds of the shopping I've got to do, but I've got a little more to finish up in the next few days. Two-thirds. That doesn't sound like uh, – well, that's not bad. I'm that, That's usually two-thirds more than I would have done at this time. But I'm yeah. completely done. Well, good for you. you staying ahead not- of the game here. I have a few people to shop for, so that makes it a lot easier. Um, Alberto Mendoza, one of the guys that I, I'm looking forward to getting on the show sometime soon. Um, you know, I was talking about that quarterback's room for Indiana earlier. If if you get Tyler Cherry in, you get Alberto Mendoza in, um, you've got Taven Jackson. Uh, there's somebody I'm missing as well uh um, curtis rourke y- yes what the hell i mean it's great that's a great problem to have but in this day and age of college football who you you can't keep that kind of talent that are the same age well a lot of them, here's the thing a lot of them aren't the same age and here's here's what i kind of predict and this may be way off base but it's kind of the way i was kind of thinking Rourke's the older one, right? Rourke's is he'll be a one year player. Yeah, that's what uh, I saw. Grad transfer. So, so what'll happen what is want. and that's exactly what you want. Play. Yeah. Go, no, go right, ahead. I had to clear my throat. So anyway, Curtis Rourke, he'll come in, he'll likely take the reins in year one, and then that'll be it for him. What I predict will happen after the fact, unless Indiana goes back and finds somebody else in the portal, that essentially leaves room for Taven Jackson to be the starter in year in for his junior and senior season or and again the other option would likely be someone in the portal and then after that you're grooming Alberto Mendoza who will be a freshman at that point and likely a redshirt freshman so the the hierarchy of starting quarterbacks if things go the way that Signetti might be planning in his mind and again I'm not in his mind so maybe I know absolutely nothing about this I feel like He's thinking in his head, it's going to be Rourke this year. It's going to be a veteran that may already be on the roster next year or somebody else in the transfer portal. And I'm referring to Taven Jackson, but I say veteran on the roster. He'll be a junior at that point. And then after that, it's Alberto Mendoza or whatever else he's got cooked up. Uh, And again, that all might be way off base, and that's okay if it is. But you have to have a tentative plan in place on who your successors are going to be at that quarterback position. Because if you don't, then you're scrambling every year like Tom Allen was trying to figure out who your starting quarterback is going to be. Yeah, a quarterback race each and every year. That's not going to be the case. That's another thing that's not going to be the case, I don't think. I I think that whoever the guy is going to be is going to be established. And I, I agree with what you said right there. And that's what you have to have. The key word you said there was a plan. You got to have a plan in place and active. And boy, you, you get these guys and you have just that. And so success uh, makes you makes it a lot easier for you to do things as well. When you're successful, if someone leaves, it's it's not as hard to replace that person. So looking forward to seeing what they do there. Again, National Signing Day is tomorrow. Tyler Cherry has said that he's, uh, going to announce and sign between uh, the early signing period, which tomorrow is the first day, and generally most guys announce and sign on that signing day. Maybe because it's so, it is that day. Maybe Tyler Cherry waits a day or so 
uh, to make the announcement. I'm not sure. We'll we'll find out, but it will happen this week uh, between Wednesday and Friday, uh, one way or the other, because he's already uh, made that announcement. So that'll be interesting. But I, I'm looking forward to seeing the 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 total, the complete list of what Indiana is going to have with the the guys that are coming back. Um, and and they've got some important pieces coming back, very important pieces come back, all in different uh, positions. Uh, offensive line, running back, wide receiver. It's uh, it's it's a good start for for Coach Signetti. And but it also, when you can get those guys back out of the portal, that just says a lot. They they especially guys like Donovan McCulley, like I said earlier, dude could have gone anywhere. Um, he, he showed he was able to show what he could do last year and could have gone anywhere, but he chose to come back, not even knowing who the starting quarterback is going to be. That's that's confidence. He has confidence in what Kurt Signetti is going to be doing. So the fans and the fans have embraced it, uh, like I have not seen uh, in all of my years of covering uh Indiana uh, even going back to being a, a, a student um yeah they they supported and had fun behind Tom Tom Mall or Tom Bill Mallory and there wasn't social media then so he he would have had the kind of support uh, I, I'd say uh because he also he won with guys that probably weren't um mostly weren't NFL type guys Anthony Thompson had a couple of years. You did have Trent Green. Um, but, man, there's an actual chance for Indiana football to be fun. I think it's going to be fun. Uh, Let me ask you this, Jim, and this, this may be a stretch, but what do you think the probability is that Indiana sells out their opening, their season opening home game against Florida International this year? Again, it's not a big-name opponent, but with all of the hype surrounding Indiana football, which is weird to say, and the potential, people say this is the sleeping giant program. We've talked about that for a couple of weeks now. Whether that's the case, that is yet to be seen. That, that'll, you know, only come and go as it decides to. But do we think that there is any chance that the opening game at Memorial Stadium for Kurt Signetti is a sellout? Uh, Indiana Creek Walker says 100% sellout. I, um, I, I put it at 40, 60 only because of the opponent. Uh, the opponent will bring no one. Yeah. So that means you've got to fill that entire stadium. And I don't know that that's going to happen against an like Florida international, but uh, I don't have the schedule. We saw what they did against Idaho. Remember a couple years ago when they were in well, that was an FCS opponent. They I don't know if they right. sold out Idaho, but it was close. You're you're right. I mean, and I don't know um, whether they actually do or not. We'll find out whether people buying it that way. It's it's a lot easier for someone in Salem or South Bend or fans, you know, from all over to be supportive, but they can't be at the game actually. So, uh, but it will be interesting to see that game itself. Uh, it's a great point to bring up because that game itself will be very interesting to see what they do from a, uh, from a fan base perspective. Now, whomever, who's the first big 10 game that they play at home? I don't have the at schedule. Home, it is Maryland, their first home big 10 game. Okay. Now that, and they still will have a uh, tongue of Bialoa, right? Man, is he still going to be around? Did he not go to the NFL or declare for the draft? I could be uh, wrong, I, but I have not followed him. I don't know. I but cannot believe now, how long he has been in college football. A, a Big Ten game, I would imagine, definitely would sell out. I would, I would think. But no, no, no. Hold on, real quick though. Uh, Talia Tagovailoa would not be with Maryland next year. Well, I'm sure they've got some money in, in the fold. So it's a Big Ten game. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see the fan interaction, the uh, the growth uh, in, in that department because Indiana needs that uh, in, in multiple ways. They need it for a, just a program to be able to support itself, number one. 
and then they need it for for fan interaction to to have some kind of home field advantage because if you know you're talking about playing in a fifty thousand seat stadium as opposed to going to Michigan uh, Michigan uh, for one hundred and ten thousand or Ohio State for another hundred thousand or Penn State for a hundred thousand. Um, so it'll be very, very interesting. So it, uh, that, but that's a great point and a great question. Indiana tonight on the hardwood against Moorhead state and a game that a bounce back game for Indiana. They have to come back off of a tough loss, which it's probably harder coming off of a tough loss that a close tough loss to such a highly ranked team like Kansas at home with that environment than it was the UConn game. Uh, you know, Todd said those are one of those games that you just, yeah, you bury it. You, you, part of that was was Auburn just getting red hot, uh, and you, you put that one away. Kansas game's not, not, not in that category. That's a game that uh, could have been won. Uh, some say should have been won, but regardless of that, you've got to put that in the rearview mirror and move forward and play a team – that you that's not going to get you up as much as say Kansas was, you know, it's a lot easier to get up for Kansas than it is Moorhead state. Um, I'm sure that there are possibly some guys on the team that had never heard of Moorhead state who knows, but uh, they have got to get back up back on the horse and play like they did against Kansas. Now, what will be the substitution patterns? against Moorhead State. It's a lot easier to not have to play guys as long, but it's not it's not the fact of how long guys are playing. It's the, the when. It's when the substitutions are made. How, are, are you taking three guys out at a time? Uh, is that going to return, or is it going to be a, a, a pattern similar to what we saw against Kansas with just fewer minutes for those guys? Uh, but you can't say fatigue is a factor again, because Kansas did the same thing. Their guys played longer. As a matter of fact, I think if you, I, I know if you took all five starters and averaged their minutes, Kansas had higher, more minutes played, uh, per starter than Indiana did. So it, it, you cannot claim that as a, as an excuse. I don't think, uh, and today you, you just got to get in better condition. Because the, the, the guy's got to play. We'll see what happens tonight. I don't expect uh, much, but uh, Robert pointing out Kentucky lost to Morehead State a few, quite a few years ago. Well, that's quite a few years ago. So it's not that stuff can't happen, but the fact that the students aren't there, you do have, there are some, some variables you add in. It's, it's a game. It's not Kansas, so you're not going to have the same crowd involvement that you did from Kansas. So everything's down, two steps down. And that 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 carries over. Do, do the players go down two steps? Uh, they just got done with finals. There's nobody on campus. There's not much going on. Um, you're not playing a, a high-profile team. You still have to get up in your mind and play at the same level that you played against Kansas. They, they need that effort. They need that effort every game. They need to win every game that they can. So you have to bring that effort every game. And I know that that's hard to do mentally, but that's what separates the teams that, that win and the teams that don't. So we'll see what Indiana can manage uh, there. Of course, the post-game show tonight with Todd Leary comes after the game. That should be around 8.40 or so, thereabouts. Uh, just giving you a guess on when that will happen. And uh, but we'll, Hank, Todd will be coming to you from Hoosier Hanks East, live there on College Mall Road. So you can stop by there and uh, enjoy the game with Todd if you're not going. Or you can stop by afterwards and, and uh, enjoy it there. But we'll certainly find out. John Boy, what uh, what do you have going for the rest of the of the week and today? 
Man, uh, well, I guess if you're if you're asking for what what I actually got going on, we're recording another episode of the Out of Touch podcast tonight. So if you're if you've enjoyed listening and checking that out, be on the lookout tomorrow afternoon as we release our twenty first episode of the year. So and shout and, out to everybody who's followed along with that. Yeah, and please give a uh, not a complete rundown, but a, uh, a, a just a, a short list of some of the wacky topics that you guys. <laughs> Because. So I haven't completed my rundown yet for the night, but uh, there'll be some Christmas theming in there for sure. And we may take it in a not a traditional Christmas direction. But if, if you've listened to the show before, you know that we we kind of go off the rails in in every direction. So uh, check that out on, my, on if you want my YouTube channel, just my name, John Alden. I may be changing that soon, but it's currently under my name. Um, but yeah. Uh, check that out if you're if you're in no, but, uh, but you I, I, some of the wacky actual uh st- subject matter that you, you've talked about and, and we'll be talking about that's what i was talking about there's oh yeah people. well I, I know what you're asking me but i haven't gotten super detailed into what we're doing today i'm not but. talking about tonight i'm talking about in the past oh, things we've done oh um, i'll give you the weirdest thing we've talked about so far and i don't i, I gotta be a little discreet since this goes on radio but uh, we've had people call in. I posed the question, do people use the restroom with the door open? And we've had a few different people share their thoughts on that. And uh, so if See, that's, what, if that's, that's something one, that interests you, then check us out. That's one that uh, I missed, thank goodness. But um, where would you be talking seconds. about? Well, it doesn't matter now, I guess. We're out of time. But, man, that would have been uh, something to follow up on. That was a weird one. But, man, I can't thank everybody enough today for uh, being on the show with us. Of course, Mike DeCourcy from the Sporting News and the Big Ten Network. As always, big thanks to him. Cronny Couser as well for uh, being a part of the show. John, the producer, for keeping us between the white lines. No more important than each and every one of you. We are so grateful for you. We'll be back tomorrow to do it all again. John Boy, who's on the lineup? Uh, we'll see Rick Bozich, Kyle Ned and Rip, and Dylan Sin. Or is he? I can't think of Dylan Sin's Wednesday or Thursday, but there'll be He's some Wednesday. duration of that. He's Wednesday. There we go. All right. We look forward to it. Thank you guys again. And until tomorrow or tonight, actually, at post game with Todd Leary, I'm Jim Coyle. I will see you on the radio. Thanks for listening to Indiana Sports Beat Radio. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube page for more clips and team coverage of Indiana basketball, football, and more. You can also find full episodes and tons of other content on thehoosier.com. We'll see you next time for another edition of Indiana Sports Beat Radio.